Okay, can we kick it off? Can we start or are we still waiting for people? Kick off. Yeah? Yep. Okay, um, welcome everyone to Unlocking Waterways um, and Improving River Connectivity and Restoring Ecosystems, um, a webinar being co-hosted by the Australian Water Partnership, FAO and Charles Sturt University. Next slide, please. Um, I'm Caroline Turner. I'm a program manager here at FAO. Um, we work in partnership um, with Charles Sturt University, funded by the Australian Water Partnership, to implement various um, programs across the Asia Pacific region. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and next slide, please. <laughs> Sorry. So um, for the past, uh, you could say almost three years now, um, FAO has been working with Charles Sturt University on uh, a number of issues um, all relating to um, river connectivity and fisheries and river productivity. Um, as the Asia Pacific region grapples with harmonizing growth and sustainability, our waterways demand immediate attention. Sustainable fisheries, the lifeblood of dietary needs in the region, hinge on the integrity of co and connectivity of our rivers. Infrastructure, though instrumental for development, has inadvertently compromised the health of vital river basins, particularly the Mekong River Basin. In this webinar, we venture into the heart of these challenges, exploring innovative solutions and emphasizing the need to restore and reconnect. Next slide, please. The, the, the presentations today and the work that we're going to talk about today is a result or is a part of um, the Next Generation Irrigation and Water Management Project that we program that we have here at FAO funded by the Australian Water Partnership. CSU has been a key technical partner involved in this um, programming. And so the programming looks at various different aspects um, of river basins. Um, we first look at addressing challenges associated with river basin development 
looking at ways to improve river connectivity, using spatial data as a tool to approach solutions for river basin connectivity, and then working closely with local stakeholders to ensure solutions are adapted to the local context. This program is part of a, a larger program, like I said, the Next Generation Irrigation Project. And this idea is part of a larger kind of initiative to ensure a bioeconomy that balances economic value and social welfare with environmental sustainability. And so we look at cross-cutting issues in irrigation and water management, such as irrigation performance, food security, ecosystem health, gender equality, fishes, and aquatic biodiversity. And what we're going to learn about today is about a few of those crossovers, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Next slide, please. Today's speakers are Lee, Anna, and John, all from Charles Sturt University. And to kick off our very first talk, we have, next slide, please. Lee, who is the director of the Gubali Institute and a professor um, at Charles Sturt University. Um, take off, take the mic, Lee, Lee. Thanks very much, Caroline. Can you hear me? Can I be heard okay? Thumbs up. You can hear me, Caroline? Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, great to great to see so many people joining online. Um, thanks for the opportunity tonight. It's always great to talk about the challenges uh, facing rivers and also the solutions uh, that we have. So, so my task tonight is is to talk about the the interactions between uh, river development and the the fragile freshwater ecosystems uh, across Southeast Asia. Could I please have the next slide and the next slide again? So I, I like starting some of my talks with this picture because it's really interesting. The populations of the earth aren't de equally distributed. And, that, and this is a, a figure that comes up many times now. It, it, there's more people presently on earth living inside the circle there than there are living outside the circle. And that's placing incredible amount of stress uh, on the natural resources in that area. Um, next slide, please. Fish are a very important protein source for a large number of people who are living within that circle. It supports essential sources of protein and micronutrients. It is a large part of livelihoods. It supports income, uh, which provides all sorts of benefits to many people in those areas. Next slide, please. And if you look at the role of fish with respect to other sources of protein. And this is a graph here that was produced by the Mekong River Commission several years ago. Um, you said that the amount of fish consumed per person per year is, is much higher than beef, pork or chicken. And uh, we recently completed a study in Indonesia which showed the same patterns. And this is the same pattern you see in many other countries uh, throughout Southeast Asia. Fish are very, very important parts of not only the economy, but people's livelihoods. Next slide, please. But our population is growing and the population that is dependent on fish as these livelihoods and also the water that supports these fish uh, is, is growing in the region. And we're looking at, at ways that we have to manage the population growth as the global population heads towards 9 billion people. And we increase the demands of water and food on all of these people. The next slide, please, shows that, and this is from the FAO, it shows areas of the world where they're looking at food insecurity uh, between now and 2040. And there's lots of areas within Southeast Asia where this is likely to be the case. If you then look towards the next slide, which overlays water stress by country by 2040, there's also going to be throughout the regions, a lot of increased competition for water. So if there's areas that are demanding more food and there's areas demanding more competition for water, there's going to be conflict in many areas. Next slide, please. Now to try and secure water resources for people, there was a significant number of dams that were constructed globally. And this, this map here shows all of the dams that were constructed from 1880 to 2005. And there's quite a few, if you look at North America, uh, South America was well developed, Southeast Asia, China, and Europe is extensively developed. If you go to the next slide, it shows dams that are planned for construction. And some of the areas that are very heavily uh, already, dams already exist, aren't building that many new dams. And, and a vast majority of new dam construction is occurring in the Southeast Asian region and also in South America and also through the Middle East. So there are some very defined hotspots now around the world where river development is ramping up. Next slide, please. 
but it's not just large dams where there's a lot of infrastructure being constructed. So dams essentially can provide town water supply, they can provide flood mitigation, they can provide areas to re-regulate water, but there's a significant amount of irrigation infrastructure, and these are typically structures that are less than six metres high, which are being constructed. And this map here, again, was produced several years ago by the Mekong River Commission, and it shows the sheer amount of smaller structures that are being constructed. And this is a largely to divert water for rice irrigation and other flood irrigation, but also for town water supply. And it's very significant depending on the scale you look at them. And next, actually, it was perfect transition to the next slide there. Yes, thank you. Because these things change the way that rivers function. Uh, if you build a dam or, a, or a, a weir or something on a river, it decreases the flow. It changes the frequency with which floodplains inundate. It changes the way that carbon flows up and down the river. It stops fish migrations. It creates areas that water birds can't access anymore. And so you do actually see that but slowly you start to modify the way rivers flow and this influences the habitat. But this also influences the carrying capacity of these rivers to provide food for the people who depend upon them. And so a lot of the work that we've been doing, as, as Caroline mentioned through her introduction, a lot of the work we do is trying to come up with ways that we can get win-win outcomes. How, we, how can we continue to develop our rivers whilst minimising the impacts on the environment so that we can still see those ecosystem services provided? Next slide, please. Because in various parts of the region, this has already caused impacts. And so Pakmun Dam in Thailand was very famous after it was built. There was there's crashes uh, in the fishery and these are the fishermen protesting. Next slide, please. Uh, in, this, in Australia, in the, in the Murray-Darling Basin, which is where I'm situated today, uh, after the rivers were developed, we saw big declines in our commercial fisheries and their eventual closure because they were no longer profitable. So, so as fish declined, uh, it impacted fishers' livelihoods. Next slide, please. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a figure here from the Columbia River in the USA where there's some very famous salmon migrations. After the Columbia River was developed for hydropower, there were very, very big declines in salmon migrations because the salmon were trying to access spawning grounds. And now uh, the, the river is now heavily dependent upon stocking um, for those salmon to persist. Next slide, please. And so there's been a real trend recently about understanding those impacts on rivers and developing holistic solutions to that. And, and this is a, a figure here which shows all of the different ways that you can improve rivers for to get the benefits of extracting water for productive use, but also making sure that the rivers can sustain life. And they can be as simple as screening irrigation pumps, building fish ladders on, on dams and weirs, making sure you have good habitat in the river, making sure your riparian zones are protected, uh, all sorts of things which if you integrate them together can create uh, better outcomes than you would have if you didn't implement those. And so, so the topic of, of some of our later speakers tonight, we'll explore those in more detail. Um, but my role tonight was really to talk about how we might, uh, how rivers are being impacted by river development and that there are solutions available. And uh, I think that was my last slide. If someone could transition. Yes, and so um, thank you all. And I would like to now hand over to the next speaker, Dr. Anna Horta, who will talk a little more about the, the spatial implications of river development. So thank you all. Thank you, Lee. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, yeah, so my name is Anna. I'm a senior lecturer in geospatial science at Charles Stewart Univers University. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to share the knowledge that we have gained with um, our CSU projects with FIO and the Australian Water Partnership in Southeast Asia. So basically, um, our work seeks to um, um, implement and develop spatial methodologies based on mapping river infrastructure for improved water resources management, which I think is what you'll see in the next slide, which was my presentation, presentation slide. There we go. So we can go to the next slide, please. So we know that river infrastructure developments, they are needed, but unfortunately, um, as with many interventions, human interventions, they also lead to um, serious environmental impacts. For example, loss of habitat and biodiversity um, by restricting um, movement of, um, I think it's going too fast. I, I knew that I didn't have that much time, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> if I could spend a little bit of time on my first slide, there we go. So yeah, so one of the impacts is um, restricting uh, movement of mi migratory species. So we, we saw just on these slides, the impact that it can have on salmon migration, for example. Uh, river infrastructure can also uh, alter uh, ecological process like water flow and sediment transport. Um, it does disrupt disrupt water availability because that's the main function of river infrastructure, of course, is to divert water for some sort of use. Um, and that can be more or less serious if we consider uh, the recent uh, changes in weather patterns. And it might also have impacts, uh, socioeconomic impacts, because uh, it causes a disruption in the river system and that can cause also a reduction in the fish populations, for example, that are available to local uh, communities. So next slide, please. So um, the Mekong River Basin does exemplify some of these issues. So we've seen significant, significant river infrastructure impact uh, in natural flows and aquatic biodiversity. So we know that we need this river infrastructure. So I suppose the challenge is to achieve this effective water management where we can balance the impacts of habit fragmentation with uh, ensuring uh, water demand or um, water availability for different uses like irrigation, fisheries, aqu aquaculture, and energy production. So one way to do this is to adopt a strategy that uses spatial planning approaches that can inform these decision uh, decision making uh, processes. And so these strategies, um, they can include the accurate mapping of river infrastructure of all sizes from large to small and also river connectivity assessment. So uh, by adopting a spatial planning strategy, you can actually create context specific assessments of river infrastructure when they act as barriers for to water flow and feed movement. So in the next slide, um, I just put in a, a basic or let's say general definition of spatial planning. So it does change depending to who you talk to. But in, in summary, uh, spatial planning basically enables, so it's, it's a framework that enables informed decision making. And it does that by using geospatial data. So what exactly is geospatial data? That's just data with location. So um, it's, it's the possibility of mapping accurately the location of all features that you see on the ground. So that includes the river network, that includes your river infrastructure. So with geospatial data, we know where things are, where something is happening, and what is the extent of something uh, that is happening and how often it occurs. So you can imagine that by using geospatial data in this framework and spatial planning framework, you can, um, for example, assess and mitigate the impacts caused by the presence of river uh, infrastructure. And you can indeed develop those context specific planning tools because the spatial planning frameworks, they allow you to accommodate, accommodate unique characteristics um, of each river uh, system. So that means that you can tailor management practices based on what geospatial data and um, the results of geospatial methodologies tell you. Next slide, please. So um, you heard me talked about uh, the fact that geospatial data powers spatial planning. Um, and it works quite well uh, when we have large, comprehensive, detailed data sets available. And that happens more often than before in some countries, but actually uh, in most uh, Southeast Asia countries, uh, there is still lack of comprehensive detail uh, geospatial data sets that we can use for uh, water resources management. It is changing. Um, that's, that's a reality. Um, but our goal when we started working on this project was to actually develop a low cost, time efficient spatial planning method that could use that geospatial data that was available or that we could gather in some form um, to produce a, a spatial planning framework that could be easily used by everyone looking into um, water management uh, from the perspective of acting upon river infrastructure. Next slide. So this was our driving force. So we wanna make sure that water availability was ensured. So keeping in mind that water use is very important and it, it is important for a lot of aspects in the communities in, South, in most so Southeast Asia uh, countries. 
Also, we wanted to make sure that uh, in our approach, we recognize the value of local fisheries. Remember that fisheries are important source of food security. Um, and so a lot of livelihoods are dependent on fish being available in the river. And we were aware that there's a rapid development of new river infrastructure want, wanted, wanting to be built. And there's also a lot of infrastructure that probably need some re rehabilitation of um, some sort. So uh, keeping in mind that when we talk about river infrastructure, we're actually referring to barriers to water flow and fish movement. What we want to do is to make sure that we can restore water availability and most importantly, uh, fish species or the presence of fish species by adopting a barrier prioritization uh, approach. So which barriers should we act on first and which barriers are causing more damage to the river system? And so that's why a spatial planning framework is ideal to address these uh, sort of questions, because under a spatial planning uh, framework, we can gather different data from different sources and conduct those assessments. So next slide, please. Uh, this is an example of a spatial planning methodology uh, that is very useful um, and that we have applied. You can see there the link to the paper that we published last year. So it's a quite straightforward spatial planning approach, which relies on five basic uh, stages, uh, with the outcome being the ranking of our river infrastructure, our river barriers, to know exactly which one should be looked at first or which ones should be considered first to restore uh, water flows or to to ensure that fish species are, um, are pro protected or re restored as well in, in the system. So those five stages, they go um, first, we need to identify all potential barriers. We then undertake some spatial analysis of each potential barrier using a specific set of criteria. We also include some field work here because we want to make sure that what we know about our barriers matches or with what we see on the ground. And then we conduct a biological and a socioeconomic assessment. So why is this uh, methodology suitable for um, catchments in Southeast Asia? That's in the next slide, please. So it's basically a very simple and reliable um, uh, spatial or GIS methodology because you can combine both quantitative quantitative data but also expert knowledge and local knowledge as well. It doesn't require a lot of computational effort. I think this is still an important aspect these days, although again things are changing, but it's quite straightforward. You might need to have someone knowing a little bit of GIS to be able to do it, but it's quite straightforward to implement. It can be applied to all species and different life stages from both um, capturing both upstream and downstream movement movements, and it also caters for different types of barriers, like I said, small to large barriers. And most importantly, it can be integrated with economic studies and also river connectivity assessments. So um, when I talk about mapping river barriers, which was the first step on applying this methodology, so we're looking at uh, structures like the ones I have here in the photo. So basically any type of structure, it can be irrigation weir, it can be a dam for hydropower um, production. Um, so it's just a type of structure that stops water flow and fish movement either completely or just partially. Um, so these are considered barriers to river connectivity because, because they cause habitat fragmentation. Um, and so that's why it is important that we know the location of all barriers, not only the big ones, but also the small ones. So in the next slide, I'm just showing you an example of one of our recent projects with AWP that we did in Indonesia, where uh, if you look at the information that is currently available about the location of um, river infrastructure, so if you search available databases about this, you only find about 15 in the specific subcatchment, which is the famous Chitarun River uh, catchment. However, after our work, after applying this methodology, we found out, and if you just click the next, yeah, there we go. It gets more red, as in uh, there's actually much more to know, um, as you could also see in that slide that Lee presented. So that's what we try to do is to unveil these, the, the true location of this infrastructure so that we can have this holistic assessments about what we should do to improve connectivity in the catchment. So next slide, please. So this is where all the pieces fit in. Uh, sorry, it's not a very um, aesthetical uh, workflow, but one that really works for me because I can see how, how the pieces uh, come together. So 
if we want a, a program, an approach for water resources management and biodiversity restoration, we really want to map all river barriers and attributes of those barriers. We want to apply a spatial methodology to prioritize which barriers should we um, work on first. And we can also use the location of those barriers to do the, our river connectivity assessments so that we actually uh, can point our um, decision makers and also our funds to work on the high priority barriers. So next slide. So in terms of river connectivity, just going a little bit into the details of what it means, you can think of river connectivity as to the extent to which different parts of the river ecosystem are linked together. So they enable the free flow of water, of organisms, of fish, of nutrients. So when you put in a barrier, what you're causing, you're causing a disruption, a fragmentation of that uh, connectivity. Next slide. So uh, when we look at uh, a, a, a management approach from the point of view of river connectivity, so measuring habitat fragmentation. So we really want to know uh, where the barriers are that cause uh, uh, fragmentation, so that cause changes to that fish movement and water flow. And we also want to know the level of fragmentation, because that will depend on not only the location of the barriers, but also the type of the barriers that we are um, that we are uh, that, that that we have in the system. Next slide, please. So why is this important? I hope that right now you have already a, a set of scenarios in your head of what you can do with a map like this and with river connectivity assessments. But basically, this can help you to strategically prioritize which barriers you're going to rehabilitate or modernize. It can also help you select locations for new infrastructure. We can also do that. Uh, you can uh, efficiently manage water allocation for different uses. And you can conduct re regulatory activities because you will know exactly where each uh, project has been implemented or with where each infrastructure is operating. Next slide. So again, an example of how this can work and how we've done this uh, in reality, again, from this recent project with IWP in Indonesia. Uh, so here, uh, river connectivity that we measure as the extent of river length that is impacted by the barrier. You also need to know uh, to do the calculations of river connectivity, you also need to know how passable the barrier is. So the passability is just the probability of a fish to go through a barrier. And of course, that depends on the features of that barrier. So by knowing the location of the barrier and its passability, you can just input that into a very known index, which is the Dendritic Connectivity Index, published in 2009 by the team by um, Professor David Kut team. Um, so if you have a DCI, which is short for this, the name of this index, um, if you have a DCI of 100, that's basically your free flow river, right? So the more the river gets uh, impacted with uh, barriers, the more that uh, DCI starts um, decreasing or increasing. So again, some uh, um, results here that we got for the barrier, uh, sorry, for that project in Indonesia. So if you consider all the 185 barriers, our DCI was actually quite low. You see there are two um, denominations for this DCI. You see DCI D and DCI P. Uh, actually, with this index, we can differentiate between the connectivity to fish that live within the system, so inland fish, that will be your DCI P, and we can also quantify the, the fragmentation for fish that come from the ocean, so that's your D DCI D, that's for diandromous fish. So initially, with those 185 barriers, we had those values, sorry, I think it's automatically flicking through, um, so we had really low values of fragmentation, and that was no surprise because I think you can see clearly there on the map, there's three huge reservoirs there um, caused by the presence of three large hydropower, um, uh, hydropower dams. So basically what we tried to do was to create different scenarios um, where we uh, assigned passability of one uh, to different barriers to see if we can make an improve improvement on that DCI. And you can see going from the left to the right, the DCI increases um, if you start uh, rehabilitating a larger number of barriers. So I had 12 barriers on my first scenario, which is your first image on the left, and I had 55 barriers 
on my scenario on the right. And of course, uh, where those barriers are located also matters. So you can see there on the third image that we have a lot of barriers that I've turned into passability of one, so fully passable. Um, and that means that that part of the downstream system is now more open to your fish that come from the ocean. So of course, um, the DCI for diandromous fish is going to increase as well. I can see someone saying for me to go slower. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time, but you will have the slides and there's my email as well. So if you do have any questions, uh, please let me know because I am up to my last slide, I think, uh, which is my conclusion. So, um, I suppose for us, we considered mapping river infrastructure an important tool for decision making, not only to locate all potential river barriers, but also to enable river connectivity assessments, we can, which can be a really important decision making uh, tool. Um, there's obviously scope to develop these methods further, uh, but I suppose the message that I wanted to convey was that you can do this even with little data and just a little bit of GIS knowledge. Um, from our recent project in Indonesia, uh, we could tell that uh, results um, they improve for DCI, they can improve uh, with individual intervention that specific specific barriers located in the in the catchment. So they can that can be translated into a huge improvement in DCI connectivity. And then also, of course, the more number of barriers that you re rehabilitate, the more investment that you will have to make, but also a larger improvement in the DCI index um, as well. Again, I'm sorry I had to go so fast. I hope I still kept it under the 15 minutes, but I'll just uh, pass it on to my colleague, John. Uh, thank you, Anna. Um, yes, so my name's John Canellan, a senior researcher at Global Institute, working with both Anna Lee and a, a whole team of people um, about infrastructure, but we're also working a lot on the social components of how infrastructure and people um, integrate together, um, as well as the integration of that into ecosystem health. So I'm going to talk about the motivations and abilities of, of different stakeholders to be able to implement and institutionalise fish passage or fishways. Uh, next slide, please. So as Anna and Lee were talking about, you get, uh, whenever you're building a weir or a dam, often you can get uh, the infrastructure is blocking the migration of fish. And this is important for people and for ecosystem health. The diagram on the left shows the, the simple concept of, of the fishway is to help that fish or help those fish get uh, past the barrier and continue on upstream so that they can breed and continue their life cycle or be caught by fishermen and contribute to the to the health and the socioeconomics of the communities upstream. The, the bottom photo there on the left-hand side is actually the construction of one of our fishways. And that's showing the same thing as the concept, but just showing it in a more uh, like in a photograph based way. The river is not flowing, but that weir was identified in the prioritization processes of causing uh, blockage to fish migration, which was important. And that fishway that we're building there is now allowing, once the, the flow comes back into the river is allowing the uh, fish to pass. So from a social perspective, one of the methods we're using is a method called motor. And it is really around about motivations and abilities of stakeholders. And it works off that if you think about, so you have triggers, you have motivations, you have abilities, and that leads to a certain action. So if you think about a trigger, it can be thought of as a prompt to, to an action. The motivation, it's a function of the perception. So you're either, you're either motivated to do something about that or you're not motivated to do something about that. And, and that is around the perception of is, if it's an opportunity or it's seen as a threat. Um, ability comes into that and we break ability down into the financial, technical, institutional and social. And if you have the ability to do it, you may be more motivated. If you don't have the ability, you may be demotivated to do it or not as motivated. And that leads to an action. 
So really the th simple way of looking at it is that motivation show shape what people are willing and interested to do and then your abilities determine if you can actually do it. So next slide, please. So even though we're talking about concrete and uh, building actually infrastructure in, in on top of other infrastructure, really our focus is around the implementation, the local implementation and the local institutionalization and ownership of uh, fish passage within the countries that we work in, primarily in Southeast Asia. And this is just showing some of the examples that, so we take a, a with the people-centric um, process that we're taking, it's such things as having master classes, which is about learning how, what fish passage is and then how to build fish passage. It's about being on site together with local engineers, um, going through a whole design process, then actually building that infrastructure and then actually monitoring the success of that infrastructure. So that that's this whole system that we're um, concentrating on the social aspects of how our local stakeholders can implement fish passage. So next slide, please. Uh, inclusion is also a very important component of, of um, when we're considering the fish passage. So we work with uh, a lady called Mia L. Uh, Urbano from Alinea that, that is helping us to integrate inclusivity or JEDSI into our programs. And when we look at the bottom program, uh, the look at the bottom diagram there, we work within that sensitive and responsive um, categories down there. If you look to the right and you see the the small fish and the and some of the larger fish, if we only took a commercial interest, for instance, if we only concentrated on the commercial interests of what the community or what the, the fishermen were doing, we might concentrate on large fish, but we take a, a very inclusive approach and that means that we concentrate on all sized fish. Those small fish there in the photo, very important for um, subsistence fisheries and maintaining the health within the region. So we take an approach um, around that. The photo also shows there that Two of the um, community concerns were about when they're trying to pass the infrastructure, that the flows are too high and that um, it can lead to drowning. So a bridge was installed and also that children may get trapped within the fishway itself and therefore we've put screens on the fishway so they can't enter. Uh, next slide, please. So we had a number of, number of research questions. We're researchers, so we take a research-based uh, approach and we were really looking at what are these key barriers and enablers for fish passage implementation um, and around this institutional capacity. Is it about good policy? Is it about technical excellence? And some of the key enablers that we found were, so if you go yeah, next, next, and next, that, that that networking and that ability for stakeholders to work together, that social capital, capital development is very important from a donor's perspective, the donors are actually investing in that, whereas lenders are often investing in the concrete side of the, of the fish passage. Um, awareness and capacity building of fish passage within infrastructure is really, really important. And that's part of their projects have been around these masterclasses, which is about involving fisheries and irrigation and different stakeholders in relation to what fish passage is and how to build it regional events, conferences, and really getting different departments that necessarily wouldn't work together, such as fisheries and irrigation, to come together to find solutions to increase the fish migration. Uh, effective demonstration is important to stakeholders. We've found that if you go click, click, next slide, yep. And showing that the fish passage is actually effective. So this is a one hour set where we're getting up to 20 kilos of fish passing that infrastructure. So showing the effectiveness of what fish passage can actually do, that was really important in being able to uh, secure investment in fish passage in relation to the irrigation infrastructure. So the next uh, yep, key barriers, some of the key barriers is, is around financial, who pays, who pays for the design, the build and the maintenance, and that financial investment is a long-term option, um, that there's an, that, Lenders are very suspicious when they don't have a good business case. Uh, and we also found that the 
the concentration on building fishways and policy is not an endpoint. Um, so, yeah, so we've been working on with around that within the project. So next slide. One of the things that we've started to look into due to the financial uh, challenges around implementing and, and building and, and then funding fish passage is around the sustainable financing. So fish wave biodiversity credits, there's been a large growth in the carbon market that we've seen within the different areas. And biodiversity credits and biodiversity as a way of, of sustainable financing um, will increase in the future. And so that could be a way, a possibility to be able to fund fish passage through that way. So next slide. Uh, what we were talking about from the social perspectives of the build is not necessarily an endpoint. Uh, there's a whole component here to operations, maintenance, repair, and maintaining relationships within that. So if you look at the irrigation um, industry, we've found sort of sometimes there's a lack of ownership uh, and that they're, they're demotivated because they see it as a waste of, you know, possible waste of water, click yeah, ability. Sometimes fisheries lack the ability, that power within decision-making to actually work with um, owners and operators to install or effectively manage fish passage, click again. And sometimes the communities lack the ability in that sense as well, or sometimes the motivation as they're, they're fishing within the fishways. So, that, so click again. And this just shows some examples of um, that you can build a very good fishway, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the uh, the fishway will be effective. So next uh, slide. Policy and legislation is also put forward as a as a solution to effective fish passage, and that then that will um, force lenders and everyone else to put uh, fish passage on all infrastructure. And if you yeah, if you go uh, next slide, this is just an example of. So there's been fish passage installed in the, on this infrastructure here. If you look at the right-hand side, there's water coming out from um, two gates on the right-hand side. If that was operated correctly, that water should be coming out on the left-hand side to attract fish to the fishway, which is situated on the left. Also, if you look at it from an infrastructure point of view of building a correct fishway, the entrance is in the incorrect spot. So they built a fishway, but it's an ineffective fishway. So policy may have uh, sent them towards building a fishway, but that doesn't mean that that fishway is effective or operated correctly. So next slide. Cambodian example where Article 25, um, yeah, where Article 25 can help facilitate the building of fish passage, but it doesn't mean that necessarily that the fish passage will then be effective. So next slide. So going forward, adding the social component to the infrastructure building component has given us a lot of uh, new insight into how we will continue to implement and institutionalise fish passage in um, Southeast Asia and, and other countries that, we, that we're working in, including Australia. Um, we will continue with what we're doing, but we will do it in slightly different ways around the social aspects. Inclusivity will remain a, a major component. Um, and then really this sort of further integration of the social concepts and the social dimensions into fish passage uh, implementation. Thank you. Thanks, John. And just to briefly introduce myself, my name's Emily Barber and I'm the Mekong Program Lead at the Australian Water Partnership and I'll be facilitating the discussion. Uh, I see that was there's one question currently in the Q&A. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to add them there. Um, Lee, if you'd like to turn your camera back on and I'll just start the discussion. Um, I've got a question for all of you. One of the things that this work really highlights to me is that We've long, seen, we've long known that infrastructure can have profound benefits as well as many neg negative impacts on communities and on the environment. And yet there's still often a disconnect and you 
really touched on this, John, between engineering, design and operation of infrastructure and an understanding of who actually benefits and who might be negatively impact, impacted by this infrastructure. Fisheries are, of course, at the heart of this intersection, intersection between communities, environmental health, um, river connectivity and infrastructure. And so during these presentations, we've heard a number of different solutions and approaches to addressing these challenges. And I'd like each of you to just very briefly reflect on what do you think we need to do differently that's going to be more effective than what we've been doing in the past to improve river connectivity and restore ecosystems. Lee, I'll start with you. Where we find that the, the best outcomes and benefits are where there's a very inclusive and holistic discussion that takes place very early in the process. And, and that very much needs to include local communities. Um, for, and I think John talked about inclusivity. The more people who are involved in the early parts of the discussion, the better the solutions tend to be because it's the people who live on and, and derive their livelihoods from the rivers every day of their life are often the people who see the changes the most. And um, listening to their perspectives and incorporating their knowledge into the solutions always gives you a better outcome. And, and that's been our experience when we're implementing solutions. Thanks, Lee. Anna. Yeah, again, based on our recent project, um, I think for me, two important things, it, there has to be some sort of um, intention from the governmental point of view that they actually want to act on this. Um, and when I say government, mm -hmm. it actually involves different ministries because when you were saying that it needs to be a holistic, it actually needs expertise from different people to come together to find a solution. So that needs to be, the intention needs to be there because that unblocks a lot of things like funding and availability of people to work on things. And then another aspect that I found really um, interesting and inspiring even is the 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 sharing of knowledge because sometimes you know different countries they'll be in different stages of how they do the things and when we have the opportunity to share our knowledge and pass it on um you know you can make, make a lot of change with that so you can help them um just have that quantitative step into if the the governmental will is there to make things change then they have the tools to actually start acting on it and sometimes even better than uh, what we did, for example, um, in the case of um, you know uh, acting on river connectivity, um, and then touching on what Lee said, co-design is really important. You cannot apply these methodologies just from the expert GIS expert point yeah. of view. You actually need to bring everyone into the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Anna. John. Yeah, and I would add to that that. Um understanding your social context very well is uh is really really important and i'm mm -hmm. and i i guess an example of that may be that uh so an irrigation department they are charged with delivering water uh they're uh, delivering food security through irrigation cropping um and so their governance structure and their the whole way that um yeah, that they're going forward is actually to deliver on those outcomes. And then we say, you need fish passage on your infrastructure. And, and then they have concerns such as what we've found. One of them is that it's a waste of water. We're going to waste water if we put water through the fish passage. And so you have to work together on that because actually fish passage doesn't necessarily have to use more water. Um, if we cut into our infrastructure, we may may destabilize the um, the infrastructure. So only by working together with those engineers are we able to design a fish way that then will allay their fears, so that they we're not cutting into their their weir and we're not the you know we're not um, destabilizing it. Uh, and then that that sort of goes on for all of the different aspects of whether 
they have the ability or the fisheries have the ability to monitor the fishway to be able to showcase that, yes, look, these fishways do work. Or the community has the ability to advocate for that or or appreciate that or make, make sure that maintenance is occurring on the fishway. So there's this whole understanding of the context of the situation that you're in and that Absolutely. one fishway uh, doesn't suit all applications and they have to be site-specific and developed in collaboration and in involving actually those key stakeholders within where your situation is. Thanks. Thanks, John. I'm just now looking at some of the questions that are coming through. We have a question uh, about data. I um, might pass this over to you, Anna. In terms of data and analysis regarding the lower Mekong River, particularly in terms of Vietnam, could you give us just a, an idea of when you mentioned about data availability, what your perspective and experience has been in terms of uh, the lower part of the Mekong within Vietnam? Um... Yeah, so we don't have a specific data set for Vietnam in terms of mapping the the small uh, barriers, at least at least not that I'm aware of. We worked in other parts of the Mekong River catchment, and um, it was um, actually this is in a paper we published last year where we looked at connectivity and disruptions in connectivity based on that. Um, I should probably add that, um, and maybe this wasn't totally clear when I did the presentation for you to get a. Uh, a, a database of the small to medium infrastructure, there's a lot of work involved with that uh, in terms of um, a lot of manual work. I mean, so the way we work is that we use satellite imagery to identify the location of river infrastructure. There are some uh, novel work being published uh, very recently that tries to use some sort of machine learning um, to facilitate and to speed up that process, but uh, that's still not um, effectively implemented in our workflows. So we still have to do a lot of work manually. So it's quite normal actually that you don't have this uh, sort of database available. So if if that's the data they were referring to, to the location of uh, all river infrastructure in that specific part of the Mekong, I don't know. Uh, I don't think it exists. I don't, I don't at least we haven't, we haven't done it uh, for sure. Maybe another project in there, maybe. Sure. Uh, if they're looking for the location of large dams, you can access that. There's at least three databases that have that available for worldwide. And there's also um, river network, river hydrology data that is available in worldwide databases. I hope that answers the, the question. Thanks, Anna. Lee, John, did you want to add something to that, Lee, first? Um, oh, if we're talking about the lower Vietnam, um, I know that the, the Mekong River Commission does have a very large database of infrastructures across the region, which is publicly available through their website. Uh, but we are, we are quite often find that the, the infrastructure that's disclosed publicly um, is often not a complete data set, as Anna pointed out. So um, when, you, when Anna was talking about her work earlier, mm. uh, quite often you will use either satellite imagery or on ground ground truthing where you actually have to mm. go in and visit the river and you are quite often find more barriers than are available on official data sets. We quite, and, and we even find that often in Australia as well. So it's, it's a worldwide issue. Thanks, Lee. I might actually, I'll just move on to the next question. And this really relates to what you were saying, John, in terms of context. So there's a question here about um, Ethiopia being um, the poorest country in the world in terms of uh, and then in terms of looking at the impact of aquatic environment structures during both the construction and design and the costs that are associated with our, being able to actually manage um, the implications of those hydraulic, hydraulic infrastructure uh, in terms of environmental impact. In interested in some thoughts in terms of what are some things that we need to think about before infrastructure is being developed or can we do after it's already developed and how do we navigate some of those solutions um, where you have lower budget to be able to mitigate those impacts? You want me to start on that one? John, if you if you can. Yeah. Yep. Um, yes, please do. Yeah, I think it relates back to the to what we were talking about with the context. 
It's a, it is a really difficult question in relation to power dynamics within any country and the com and the local community versus um, those the larger the larger uh, benefits that may be seen across the whole country versus the benefits or the disbenefits to the local community in the in the singular area. Uh, but understanding that context of how important how important are those fisheries to those communities and then finding a way to um, yeah at least be able to input that into the decision making so that it's not totally ignored and in the past if you look at USA and you look at Australia and even in cases of the USA where it was known the impacts that would occur to salmon migrations, but they chose to do it anyway because they saw the benefits of uh, of the hydropower, for instance, that yep. would be greater than the social disbenefit of um, of losing fish. So it's not it's not an easy one, but you at least have to have the information there available for it to uh, to be even included in the uh, in the decision making. And I guess this is where it relates to some of the things that could go wrong. And maybe, Lee, if you want to add anything to that, some of your slides talked about things that have happened. Um, sort of what, what are some of the uh, costs of not taking this approach up front? Oh, I mean, absolutely. It's in some of the areas of Southeast Asia, quite often the argument is, is propagated that Ah oh, well, if we lose some of the fish, we can just start up a, a a fish hatchery and restock the fish. Now that no fish hatchery is as productive as a river, like a river will always produce more fish than a hatchery will. But the other thing too is, from a biodiversity perspective, uh, a river produces more species than a hatchery can. I mean, in the Mekong itself, where you have up to eight hundred species in a in a particular zone, you know, there's no hatchery in the world that produces eight hundred species of fish. Only the river can do that. Yeah. And so the cost is the cost is biodiversity, the cost is livelihoods. The other thing too is there's another argument propagated that well, you know, we can breed hatchery fish and they're bigger, and they grow bigger than the smaller fish in the river. But um, some fish, and, and we quite often hear this when we hear different species of fish have different micronutrients. Like some fish have more fatty acids or more omega threes and those sorts of good things that are good for you. That's not equal amongst all species of fish as well. So you need to be very careful that you're not losing some fish that are more important food sources than others. Uh, and, the, and the other obvious one is, is the impact on livelihoods. Um, the very famous number in Australia is, uh, is before the rivers were developed, there was over 13,000 fishermen employed across the Murray-Darling Basin uh, in the commercial wow. fishing industries. Uh, and at the height, over a thousand commercial boats were in operation. You know, they, these were supplying jobs to so many people and now those jobs are lost that whole industry is lost um because the fish declined and so so when it does crash it crashes very quickly and i think that really speaks to that the first question in terms of understanding that intersection between infrastructure and people and um even though we all understand that often when structures we go into designing them and operating them and there was reference um, in a couple of your slides about maintaining them as well, it's it's really difficult to separate how that how they work and then looking at who actually benefits and who may not benefit both now and into the long term. And the more that that can be done front, um, uh, the better. Uh, just having a look at uh, maybe one last question. Um, I'd like to ask about this question in terms of root river connectivity. So Anna, I'll pass this one to you. Um, we're talking about infrastructure, could you just say a couple of words in terms of if we're wanting to talk about lakes and water bodies and connectivity between those, is some of the methods that you've used to look at connectivity, how could that be applied in that that's context. a very technical question, but thank you for uh, for asking that. So uh, it all has to do with the way the Dendritic Connectivity Index is implemented. So there's the general uh, method and algorithm explained in that paper that I mentioned, the 2009 David Kut paper. But then there's actually a software, there's 
more than one software, but one specific software called Feepex, which is the one that we also use in our projects. It allows you to also calculate connectivity, taking into account the location of rivers and water bodies. So for, uh, I think it was Valerio that asked that question, um, just go and look at uh, Feepex. Um, there's a paper about that as well, and I'm uh, available to help as well. Thank you. Many thanks, Anna, and I'm aware that there's a few questions that have come in that we haven't gotten to, so we're very happy to follow up um, after the presentation to, to those questions. Uh, given that we're nearly at time, I'm going to hand back to Caroline Turner to close up the session. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, Thank you um, to the speakers for um, a really, really interesting seminar. I think that um, the work that you do is absolutely fascinating. So, um, and thank you everyone for coming and asking very interesting questions. Um, if you have any further questions about the content, um, you can get in touch with me. I'll just put my um, email address in the chat. Um, if you'd like to follow up about the project or any concepts um, within, within these projects, please, please feel free and I can connect you to the experts. Um, next slide, please. Um, so if you really want to learn more, so we have launched three um, knowledge products um, on what has been discussed today. Um, the first two are um, part of our brief series, our next generation um, water management brief series. Um, we have one on modernizing irrigation for fisheries, biodiversity, and ecosystem services, brief five. And we have, which is focuses on the work of Lee and John. And then we have Mapping River Infrastructure for Improved Water Resource Management, Brief 6, which focuses on the work that Anna talked about today. Um, if you're interested in, in how to um, look at fish, fish barrier remediation in river basins, we have an e-learning that kind of goes through like step-by-step -step some of the challenges that you um, experience when looking at river basin barriers and then also looking at how to apply different solutions um, to some of those challenges. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So we also have a webinar coming up in May, on May the 2nd um, this year, that will talk more to um, water resource governance, looking at the JEDSI angle, and also looking at um, kind of like the water tenure angle of water resource management. Um, I will reach out to everyone again and, and invite you um, for coming along. Um, in addition, just I'm um, seeing the chat, we also have next week a webinar on JETSI policy action plan and case studies. And if you'd like to register, just click the link in the chat box. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and if you have any questions, please reach out directly and I can connect you with the experts. All right, thank you very much.